All right, so here we are. With that being said, let's start our webinar. It's one minute past three in Germany, and welcome to the last session of our first course in piglet management and farm profitability that is presented by you by Partners in Progress here at EW Nutrition. Um, I'll quickly stop my video for now because I'm having some network problems. I hope that's fine for you all. But once again, thanks for joining. My name is Felipe Barbosa, and I'm the team lead of the global technical team for swine with EW Nutrition. Just one short recap about our course. As you know, so we started our journey. So we began this journey last December. We started speaking about where everything starts, the south. Uh, so we had Dr. Chantal Farmer with us. And from there, we looked also at management intervention to increase piglet survivability with Dr. Rafa Pedrazuela, with Dr. Ocean Smith, and with Dr. Mike Tokash. And then, we're gonna speak on how nutrition will help a better pre and post weaning performance. Now it's time to look to the future. How can we, big specialists, influence the gut microbiota towards a more robust animal? And for the session that today, we have Dr. Francesc Molist from Scott Horse Feed Research, and he will be the one leading the discussion. So Dr. Molist, as most of you know already, is a reference on young animal nutrition in piglet gut microbiota. He's the head of research and development at uh, Scott Horse Feed Research in Lady Start, Netherlands, where he's seated today. And there, together with his team, Francesc, or Dr. Molist, is responsible for very good state of art research in different types of species, including piglets, sows, but also other ones like ruminants and poultry. Dr. Molis received his master's in animal science from the University of uh, Veterinary Medicine in Barcelona. And of course, he's the author of numerous scientific publications and presentations at conferences worldwide. Dr. Molis, or Francesc, as I used to call him, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation, Felipe, and it's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much for, for this podium. Great. Thanks, uh, Francesc. So with us today, we have also my colleague, uh, Federico Astorga. So Federico Astorga is our regional technical manager in Europe, and he will help us to answer a couple of questions during Francesc's presentation, okay? So Federico, as I introduced it to you during the last session, he has been working in the industry for more than 25 years. Most of his work is linked to the pig sector. Uh, Federico also has a lot of experience in poultry, Today, I'm using his piglet expertise to support us. Uh, in the last 15 years, Federico has been working on development of novel feed additives based on plants, especially, and his work resulted in several publications in magazines and presentation at international congresses. Federico is a swine specialist, as I said. Here today, his expertise will help us on answering the hard questions. Uh, I will leave all these hard questions for him. Federico, <laughs> once again, appreciate your support and thanks a lot for joining us today. No, thank you very much, Felipe. It's a pleasure for me to be here again, trying to help you in, in this uh, ambitious uh, project. Great, very ambitious and so far very successful project, Federico, you're absolutely right. So we're gonna have the question session, uh, question and answer sessions right after the presentation as before. We're gonna collect the questions during the presentation. So if you do have something, you can drop your question on the question and answer session on, on, on the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we're gonna try to answer some of them, but of course we're gonna let majority of the questions to Francesc by the end of his presentation. So he can also interact a lot with you with the audience in general. Okay, Francesc, it's a pleasure once again. So with that, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can start with your presentation. Appreciate Francesc and let's do that. We can see the presentation coming Francesc, but you are still on mute. Yes, it's perfect, but you are still on mute. Yes, now should be okay, right? Yes. 
Uh, right. Yes, now it's perfect. Great. Francesc, thank you. Thanks, Felipe, again for the invitation and also to the EW Nutrition team for, for this invitation. As Felipe mentioned, you had already quite some sessions uh, uh, under this topic. So I would try to give you my yeah, experience as nutritionist. I must say I'm not a microbiologist, so I will not talk uh, many over microbiology, fundamental and these kind of things. I will try more to understand as nutrition is how we can work with the microbiota and especially to understand what are the challenges that we have nowadays in our industry. And I must say my focus will be in the current trends in Europe. So apologize if in some countries probably still, yeah, you are in another situation that still you can use, for example, antibiotic or zinc oxide or, or, or this kind of, of products. So if we start with the presentation, of course, you are familiar with this uh, uh, slide. So we know that the, what happened to the animal is a combination of uh, what is in the gut and which microbiota is there, but also what happens to the environment. And uh, as nutritionists, we say uh, diet is really important. So not only the environment, but also the diet will influence a lot what happens in the gut in terms of uh, uh, health, but also in terms of performance. And of course, uh, in piglets, we need to understand that, uh, yeah, some uh, external factors like a stress can play an important role on having a good gut health or a good performance. So if we look what factors can play a role in having a, yeah, a, a healthy animal, what we call, so of course we can talk about genetics. Now we have more and more genetics on the market. Uh, some are more robust and others are more sensitive for, for, for some uh, uh, animal disease. Uh, of course, uh, pathogens will be a, a, a big influence. How is the farm uh, health status, reading conditions, as I mentioned before, stress. But I think two concepts that will come more and more in the future together will be vaccination and diet. So far in many countries, uh, uh, I'm a vet by training, but I never work as a vet. I always work as nutritionist. But in some countries, there's no much connection between vaccination and, and nutrition. And I think the future uh, in this era of uh, antibiotic-free diets, low zinc oxide, I think we will need to talk more uh, each other to understand what is the best diet when I do this vaccination program and the other way around. But just to, for you, of course, when the animals are not healthy or not good performing, always the diet can be blamed, but there are many other factors that can play a role in, yeah, in improving the, the gut health. So if we start, let's say, from a, a, as a nutritionist, what, what I, I see more and more is that... Uh, we need to focus much more on an earlier phase, what happened already, uh, not when the animals are born, but maybe already in the south. Can we, uh, you will see in some examples in the coming slides that we can already influence before the piglets are born, the microbiota in the south, and this will have effect to those piglets. Because if we prepare the animals good when they are young, let's say before weaning, probably will solve a lot of the post-winning problems. And, uh, and this is where we put a lot of efforts nowadays. So in the past, we were doing a lot of trials starting post-winning onwards, and we didn't pay much attention pre-winning, but also in the south. I think the future goes more and more to prepare the animal in an early phase in order to have a successful yeah, post-winning or uh, even in the growing finishing peaks performance. So everything, all the time and efforts that we spend here, we it will definitely pay back here. If we don't do nothing here and we wait until the animals are win to start, for example, changing the microbiota or to try to improve the gut health, probably most of the cases is too late. So uh, in our situation that we are winning more and more animals around uh, 30 days old, four weeks, uh, we need to put more emphasis pre-winning rather than only focus uh, post-winning. So this is a little bit what I want to talk to you. I know that Dr. Tokas did a great presentation on pre-winning uh, uh, and especially management and nutrition, but uh, still I would like to start from the beginning, what happened around the south, how can we affect the 
piglets microbiota when they are born and what happened after afterwards when the animals are win and they need to continue in the growing finishing barn. So this is a, a let's say a typical situation in Europe. No, first what we want is that when the animals are born, uh, they should uh, drink colostrum. You also had some pre a presentation on the importance of colostrum intake, so I will not go in detail. Then after this period, probably when the animals are around one week old, then you can start providing uh, yeah, some milk in case you have uh, big liters or uh, you, uh, the sows are not producing enough milk, or you can already start providing some solid feed uh, in order the animals to get used to the, to the solid feed. What is uh, uh, clear from a nutritional point of view is that the first, of course, we want that the sows produce enough milk. So this is the first, but second in the situation that we have quite a bit of piglets in the litter, probably when we go towards at the end before weaning, only milk is not enough. So the animals needs to uh, start eating. So that's why the crib feed is becoming more important. And at the end of winning, what we want is to prepare the animals that most of the animals are already eating in order to have a, success, a successful winning and in order to avoid too much stress here. So we see in practice in some countries that uh, in order to avoid to change the diet at winning, they continue giving the creep feed for three or four days post winning. Or the alternative option is that uh, uh, when you win around four weeks old, you start providing this post winning diet in already in lactation. So the animals are familiar also with this diet before they are win. And this you will see it in the coming slides. It's really important that when we win the animals, we don't change, uh, let's say, the diet. They suffer enough uh, stress because we remove them from the sow, we mix them, we transport to a, a new facility. So please, if possible, keep the same diet uh, before and after winning. So at least the animals are familiar with the, this diet and also try uh, to increase the feed intake pre-winning as much uh, as we can. So there's uh, yeah, quite a bit of animals already eating at, at winning. So what we want uh, pre-winning, what we want to prepare to the piglets pre-weaning. So as I mentioned, colostrum intake is definitely the first important part. If the animals don't drink enough colostrum, they don't have the maternal antibodies and this will create problems. But still we need more uh, to work on this effect. Uh, what can we do to, to program the immune system when the animal is really young and also to help the microbiota to develop and how long will last these effects? Will, uh, for example, when the animals are, are win, disappear already this microbiota of if we are able to change the microbiota pre-winning, post-winning, and also in the growing finishing barn will continue. As I mentioned, creep feed supplementation as early as possible to promote this uh, stable uh, microbiota and also to get uh, this oral tolerance. So the, the immune system will react of the animals to the new uh, ingredients or antigens in the diet. Uh, as soon as the animals get familiar with this diet, they will get to an steady situation that the immune system will not react more. And at the end, what we need to do is to minimize these negative effects associated with winning. And uh, as I mentioned, we need much more work to understand what is the uh, right diet composition, but also nutrient density of this pre-winning phase in order to prepare the animals uh, post-winning. So we start uh, uh, pre-winning. Uh, the animals uh, are born here, the piglets, and as uh, uh, I mentioned from the uh, colostrum, first they get this maternal immunity, but of course with the age or with the weeks, the maternal immunity goes down. So some antibodies will last just before, uh, let's say, the first two weeks of, of weaning and antibodies will last longer. And then the animals need to develop this more yeah, active immune system or, 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 or this more uh, yeah, immune system that should protect the, the, uh, the gut barrier function and should help the animals in the further phases to fight against virus or other bacteria. So first we have the maternal immunity, then we get the, the more this passive immunity. And of course, there's a point, and we are familiar with this around winning, that the maternal immunity goes down and the animals are not, immature, are not mature yet in regards of the immune system. So here, 
we can have uh, still some challenge in terms of you will see diarrhea, but also some other uh, bacterial problems or even virus. If we look to the microbiota, also you, you know as nutritionists that the piglets are born sterile, so in the placenta, there's no contact with the uh, microbes. So all the microbes that, are, uh, that arrive to the piglets are coming from the environment, will come partly from the vagina of the sows, but also part of them from the feces and also, as I mentioned, from the, from the farm, let's say. First, the first uh, bacteria that will in, be uh, installed or, or, or will be living in the gut are aerobic bacteria. And this bacteria will start the fermentation and will start to create the anaerobic conditions that a more anaerobic community will be stable. But you see that, uh, in my opinion, as nutritionists, if we want to do something uh, to change the microbiota, sorry, if we want to do something to change the microbiota, we probably need to start in an earlier phase because when the human community is quite constant, yeah, then I think it's much more difficult to uh, interfere this uh, bacteria or this microbial uh, ecosystem. So let's try to focus in an earlier phase and let's try that these changes here will be uh, long lasting and will be protective for the later phase. As nutritionists, uh, we always have been focused on the feces, no? right? Because we give a, a diet to the animals and then we say, okay, we want to understand how much is digested this diet and, and what comes through the feces and all the nutrients that are not being digested uh, will be used for the bacteria. In the current situation, we have also learned that uh, not only uh, in the feces there's bacteria, for example, there's also bacteria on the saliva, on the tonsils of the sows. This is in our farm in Lelystad. In our farm, we have quite a bit of problems of streptococcus suis infections. For your information, in Europe nowadays, we cannot use amoxicillin in our diet. So uh, all the diets are free from amoxicillin, uh, low, uh, uh, also free from uh, high levels of zinc oxide. So uh, we have yeah, quite some challenge, let's say. So this is what we did, is to take from each piglet. So these are different liters, A, B, C. And then we take a tonsil swab from each piglet to understand the population of suis. And then what you see clearly that are already at day two of life, all the animals are positive for streptococcus suis. And you see that this concentration remain constant. And then it looks like that then when the animals get tall, goes down. But you clearly see that if we have meningitis, meningitis problems here, of course we need to fight in this situation, but probably we also need to start working here to, under, yeah, to try to avoid that this pathogenic bacteria that is in the saliva of the sows goes to the piglets and colonize the tonsils of the piglets. So uh, I'm more and more interested not only on the bacterial population of the feces, I'm also more and more interested what bacterial population we have in the vagina of the sows or what we have in the saliva. So this is a work that is quite uh, recent, 2019. And here, what you clearly see, you see different groups of bacteria. Uh, and then, for example, uh, again, if you have problems from a streptococcus, you clearly see that a streptococcus and in the saliva and in the vagina, but not in the feces. So if you want to solve the streptococcus problems, probably you don't need to focus uh, too much in the feces, focus more on the saliva or vagina. Whereas if, for example, if you have clostridium problems, then it seems that the target, of course, will be the gut and the feces. So uh, yeah, this uh, we need more and more to understand also as nutritionists that not only there's bacteria in the gut, there's also bacteria in saliva and also in the uh, vagina. So this is also a trial that we did in Scotters. And the objective of this trial was, let's try to change the diet of the sows before farrowing in order to influence the gut microbiota of the piglets. And here what you see is again in green, the bacterial population in the vagina of the sows. Then in blue uh, light, this uh, uh, light blue, you have the fecal uh, bacterial population of the, of the sows. And then you see in, in, in blue, more dark blue, the, thick, the bacterial population of the piglets pre-winning, you see it here. And in red, you see the, the bacterial population of the piglets post-winning. And what you clearly see is that it seems that the 
the, the, the bacteria population of the piglets post winning is quite linked to the pre winning population and is more evolving from the sows rather than from the vagina. So with this, we think that probably if we are able to influence the population pre winning, the effects post winning will continue because you see that are quite close the pre and post winning bacterial population. So in this trial, uh, we were playing with the uh, uh, fiber. So we, we had uh, 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 a sow diet, a lactating sow diet with low fiber, what we call inert fiber, and another one in red. We had uh, this fiber that we call uh, high uh, in, inert fiber. And then you clearly see that depending on these uh, diets before farrowing, there are some changes on some bacterial groups in the feces, let's say, of the sows. So you see, for example, that when we use this highly inert fiber, Clostridium uh, goes down. And for example, uh, yeah, there's other groups that, for example, Treponema, Bacteroidotes, but, but here, for example, the total Streptococcus goes up. So in our opinion, we say we can play before farrowing, we can change the diet already of the sows before farrowing, and we can influence the bacterial population in the feces and hopefully the piglets will also benefit from this change. So if we say what we want to do uh, pre-weaning and in the first probably three weeks, focus on, on uh, developing the, let's say, the, the gut uh, uh, ecosystem and the immune system. So here we need to understand much more the, the, the role of prebiotic or diets in changing the microbiota and probably we need to, yeah, to start using already some of these prebiotics on the, for example, on the milk replacer or some ingredients on the milk replacer, oligosaccharides, xenolin, in order to start slowly to, to shift this uh, bacterial population. And then when the animals get close to the uh, weaning, probably we need to start more working on the diet composition and, uh, and here is, yeah, in my opinion, is not uh, well understood if we need to really go to really complex high dense diet or we need to go more for diluted simple diets to stimulate feed intake here and to avoid that uh, not many animals are eating. So here we want to have a higher feed intake. So we want to, yeah, we need to better understand how we need to formulate those diets that yeah, most of the animals here are eating and they continue eating uh, post winning. So Mark, talk, uh, uh, Dr. Toka, sorry, already uh, uh, showed some results, but this is also a trial that we did. And you see, this is the, the days of, of the animals and this is the crib feed intake. And you see that goes up, but uh, still there's huge variation. So still we have uh, problems, let's say that all the animals are eating. And, and, and yeah, and this is, I think, the, uh, an interesting challenge for us that we say, no, we don't want... Uh, a lot of variation. We want that when the animals are weaned around 28 to 30 days, most of the animals are eating and not only 80 or 60% of eaters, let's say. Uh, and why we want this? Because as you are familiar, if we go uh, at weaning, if we move totally from the sow milk to the a solid diet, we change many nutrients. So the, the sow milk is probably, yeah, not probably is really rich in fat, in protein. And when we go to a, a normal piglet diet, we go down in fat and protein. But the most important part is that we introduce the carbohydrates. And this is, uh, yeah, the first time that the animals see these, uh, uh, these nutrients, let's say. So we need to do this transition really smooth and not wait that the animals are winning and then start giving a, a new diet. So this is an interesting trial that they did in uh, the group of uh, uh, Australia. And here what they did is that before winning, all the animals in, uh, were receiving uh, 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 three different diets, let's say. So there were three groups, crib feed uh, animals that before winning, they were already receiving a winner diet or animals before winning, they were already receiving a, a, a sow diet. And then what they did is that they win the animals and post winning, those animals were continuous with this winner diet. These are the effects uh, uh, post winning. And what you clearly see is that at, in, in yellow is the first two weeks post winning, that the animals that were receiving the diet before and after winning, this is this winner diet, they were able to eat more and to grow more. 
and, and the animals that were first receiving the creep feed and then they were moving to this winner diet, you see the feed intake was low, but was the same that the animals receiving a, a, a more simple sow diet before weaning, but because we changed again the diet post weaning, yeah, the feed intake was low. So if we uh, follow this, we say, okay, it seems that nutrient density is not so important, is more important that pre and post weaning we have the same diet. And when we look what happened to the gut of those animals that before weaning they were receiving the creep feed, the winner or the sow diet, we see that the animals receiving less luxurious diet, like the, the, the winner diet or the sow diet, they got the longer bilus height and they also got uh, let's say, uh, uh, especially the, the winner one, uh, more uh, uh, smaller creep depth. So it seems that also, depending on the diet that they receive uh, pre-weaning, we can influence the gut development post-weaning. So in, in the, let's say, in the past, we were focusing a lot in having uh, uh, pre-weaning diets, creep feed diets really high uh, in nutrients uh, with a lot of nutrients, let's say, probably in the future, especially when we are weaning animals at around 30 days old, seven or eight kilos body weight, probably we don't need to give so many nutrients, we need more to stimulate the feed intake. And I think uh, Dr. Tokaj already had an interesting presentation, so I, I would not more uh, focus more on this topic, I would move to the post weaning situation. So in post weaning, what we want is that uh, we want to still uh, have a positive effect from a positive feed intake from the animals, but in the absence of uh, antibiotics and zinc oxide, we need to control the substrate that is not digested because this substrate will go to the bacteria. We need uh, uh, face feeding, let's say, uh, to adapt the diet to the uh, animal requirements. Of course, at winning the management and how to do this winning is very important, especially to reduce the stress. As I mentioned before, for some uh, problems was winning, probably we need to better understand the link between nutrition and vaccination. Uh, this is again uh, mentioned uh, already before, but substrate and bacteria interactions are, are very important. And what we want is that the animals eat and, uh, and, 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 and remain health, let's say. And then if they are healthy and they eat, probably then they also grow. So what happened uh, post winning if we don't do nothing? Uh, so this is the winning situation and this is the enzyme activity of the pancreas enzyme. So you see clearly a drop on the activity because the animals are not eating. So the animals are stressed, they get a new diet, they stop eating and anorexia, if there's no uh, nutrients in the gut, then all the activity of the enzymes go down and then need to recover. So this situation, we need to solve it as much as we can. So uh, if we do a smooth transition pre and post winning, probably this drop in, 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 the, in the enzyme activity will be less important. In the countries where zinc oxide still can be used, we also did a, trials to un a trial to understand, hey, why zinc oxide is so important in, in preventing some of the uh, post winning problems. So what we did is that uh, uh, we took blood samples of animals before weaning, and then we took blood samples of animals uh, win with low levels of zinc oxide and blood samples of animals win and receiving high levels of zinc oxide, two and a half kilos per ton. And then what you clearly see is that with low levels of zinc, let's say, it seems that the plasma zinc levels go down. So you clearly see in this situation that, uh, yeah, it seems that uh, compared to the pre-winning situation when zinc oxide goes down because we cannot use it anymore, plasma zinc goes down. And you see here that when we uh, still can use this uh, uh, zinc oxide at high levels, we are able to keep the same plasma zinc level compared to the pre-winning situation. And, uh, and this can be really interesting to, uh, yeah, of course, maybe zinc oxide has some uh, positive effects on the microbiota on the gut, but zinc is also very important for the enzymes and all the, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, activities for the body. So maybe we need to understand how we can recover very fast these plasma zinc levels uh, because so far we did some trials with other zinc uh, uh, solutions and always we see this, that if we compare to the end situation, 
plasma go down. And uh, so far, we, ha uh, we have only seen uh, effects with zinc oxide. I'm keeping the same level than before winning, otherwise it goes down. And we don't know how important is this, but it might explain why, yeah, why uh, zinc oxide is still successful in promoting the growth and also uh, having some positive effects on gut health. So if we look nowadays, what are the main challenges that we have in Europe? So if we focus more when the animals are born, probably will be first rotavirus, uh, Clostridium colis. And then we, what we clearly see nowadays is that uh, Streptococcus suis is becoming more and more a problem, and especially around, let's say, two weeks post winning. If we go to the growing finishing barn, then salmonella will be a problem but probably not for the animals will be more a problem more for for human human health and then we have uh swine laitis that is lausonia that is also a, yeah would say a big problem in some situation for example when there's a big difference between day and night temperature it could be that you get acute cases of uh uh, swine laitis or lausonia so these are the yeah the main problems nowadays and you will see if we look to uh, e coli diarrhea uh, probably we understood well how to control the the diarrhea or at least yeah how we can play with the diet to have a, a less diarrhea so you will see or or, or if you are not familiar uh, probably you, you will see more and more over the uh, strep suis problems. Meningitis is not creating probably the same mortality as the, the diarrhea, but we are losing the nicest animals. So we have big animals that they are eating good and next day they have the, uh, uh, an outbreak and, and they die. So, uh, so far we don't have solutions. So if, if, one, uh, if someone in the audience has some su suggestions to control the streptococcus suis problem, please uh, yeah, share with us. So we look what happened at winning. I already mentioned with the enzymes. So the feed intake goes down because of a stress and because of other uh, changes. So then the animals stop eating. And if the, there's no nutrients in the gut, then the digestion is a problem. And then at the end, you get this dysbiosis. So then you get this diarrhea. And then what we see nowadays is that if we control these diarrhea problems, then the animals start to eat again. So this is the, the feeding curve. So they start to eat again. The gut is maturating again. So then you see that the animals are eating again. Nutrients flow come again to the, to the gut. Fermentation capacity recover. The, the dysbiosis is gone and the functional activity is also recovered. What we see nowadays in a lot of cases is uh, suis. So suis can be linked to first a diarrhea problem and then come suis or some animals do not face diarrhea, diarrhea and then they get suis. But it seems that is at a different moment than the diarrhea and it seems that is linked to this recovery of uh, feed intake. So if we look, okay, what what can be the the the, the problems targeting suicide? So from one side we say or we think that the stress uh, can play an important role. So we have developed a challenge model in as photos with suicide, and we we use the stress as a factor to increase the suicide colonization. So stress can bring leaky gut, and this can bring uh, problems. Uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, yeah, we 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 think that suicide can, yeah, as we have seen in, in that the piglets at day two already have suis. So suis can yeah, be there, but we don't know why this suis becomes pathogenic or virulent and then create a problem. So we need to understand why some animals, although they have suis, is not a problem. And other animals with the same suis, yeah, there's something that makes the suis virulent and then makes a, a problem. And another uh, link that we have seen from, uh, from the farms, let's say, is that, that the animals that are overeating, so that the animals that first they, they didn't eat much and then they, they have an explosion of feed intake, they, yeah, they are not able to handle all these nutrients and this also can increase the risk of uh, suicide. So probably it could be a combination of uh, uh, different factors, let's say, but uh, still we don't, yeah, we don't know clearly uh, why some animals are suffering and others, penmates, uh, are not suffering. So if we look to the 
post-winning diets, what we have learned so far and how we can uh, influence the gut health of the animals. So as you know, there's many, uh, or, or yeah, there's many solution coming from the additive that can be considered. But then we also say, yeah, please yeah, have a look to also the macronutrients like the fiber, the crude protein level and the fat, because if this is not correct, probably the, the, the additive will also not solve the problem. And then if you say, no, I'm not only interested in foc on targeting the gut, I'm also interested in targeting the feed intake. I want to promote a higher feed intake. Then you can use the, some flavors or other palatable ingredients like plasma or other products in order to uh, increase the feed intake. So what we have, yeah, I think clearly learned is that to be successful, especially when you have diarrhea, is that it's, is let's say an holistic approach. You cannot say, no, I have a diet that before I had zinc oxide and now I take the zinc oxide now, I put a, 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 an additive and, and, and the diet works also again good. No, we think that what you need to do is more yeah, understanding the role of the main nutrients and try to select which additive can play a role in your specific situation and not try to mixing everything and not changing to the main nutrients because then I think you will not be successful. So if we look to these main nutrients, probably you are familiar with our work, but we have yeah, done quite a bit of work on fiber. And so far, what we have said is that you need to look to the fiber from a functional point of view. So we need to better understand the role of fiber in changing viscosity, fermentability, water binding capacity, uh, bacterial binding. So it could be that the fiber can uh, simulate an, an E. coli receptors and E. coli can uh, attach to this, uh, uh, to this fiber fraction. And as you will see more and more, uh, yeah, we need to better understand uh, yeah, how much structure we need in the diets to also have positive effects on gut health. So in the past, we were focused yeah, really much on having a nice pellet, everything re really fine ground, and then having a pellet. We see more and more that having some particle size in the diet, some structure in the diet of these piglets will help to also improve the gut health. So this is some work that we did in a scotters on different fiber sources. So treatment one is a diet without any fiber addition. Treatment two, the same diet with the inclusion of 6% soya hulls. Treatment three, 12% soya hulls. Uh, treatment four, 6% sunflower hulls. Treatment five, 12% sunflower hulls. And then the last two with which throw. If you are familiar with our uh, fiber concept, we say, there are some ingredients like soya hulls that will mainly bring fermentable fiber, whereas other ingredients like the sunflower hulls or wheat straw will bring more the inert fiber. And in this graph, what you see is this is the uh, days at winning from zero up to 26 days. And here you see the fecal score. And what you see is that the higher the value, more dry feces. Uh, so you see that clearly that there's a group here of, of treatments that the, the, the feces are much drier, for example, than this group here. And if you look to the, what, yeah, what group is this one, then we are talking over these inert fiber sources, so sunflower hulls, wheat straw, oat hulls. We see all the time that they can improve the fecal consistency of the animals compared to no fiber or compared to this more fermentable fiber. So this is another work that we did with the uh, inert fiber. So we had again a, a diet with low fiber, but more uh, high in nutrients. So quite high in, in, in protein and amino acids and also some additive. The same diet, but more simple, let's say more uh, a normal uh, grain uh, soya diet. And then we use this diet and we dilute it with, uh, in this case, we use oat hulls to dilute this diet. And this is the performance in the first two weeks uh, post weaning. Uh, the first one is the feed intake and the other one is the growth. And you clearly see when you use this inner fiber into the diet, feed intake goes up, growth goes up. So that's why we say, hey, when you want to, to, to improve the, the gut health of the animals, do not concentrate too much the nutrients, 
dilute the diet with some uh, fiber ingredients and then you will have some positive effects and not only positive effects on growth but also for example we measure the stomach weight and also the amylase activity in the brushboard enzymes and you also clearly see that with this inert fiber the supplementation of oat holes in this diet result in bigger stomachs and higher amylase activity so that means also more robust gut or a stomach so at the end, uh, from all the trials that we did, uh, more and more we say, okay, uh, fiber is positive, inert fiber is positive, and probably we need to reduce the, a bit the, the, the nutrient density of the diets because then we will promote the feed intake of the animals. And then what we have seen, again, you see a negative control diet, uh, uh, let's say with a, a more luxurious ingredient, more simple diet, and then the same one, diluted and you clearly see that the dilution animals eat more so if they eat more lysine intake goes also up and then the growth goes also up so we don't need to concentrate uh, uh, much the diet what we need is to promote the feed intake of the piglets and if the, the feed intake is good automatically they will get enough lysine energy and this so we use a, a yeah, this kind of uh, uh, inert fiber, and here you have again oat hull, sunflower hulls, or wheat straw to dilute a bit the nutrient density, promote feed intake, and if the animals eat more and, and, and they are healthy, they will grow more. So nowadays, the, 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 a little bit the dilemma that we have is on the crude protein level. So uh, yeah, we know as nutritionists that when we are in this situation, high crude protein diets, then you have quite a bit of fermentation because this uh, protein that is not digested will go to the E. coli and the E. coli will use this uh, non-digested protein to, to grow and this will create also problems to the gut. So now we went to formulate low crude protein diets, but yeah, now probably we reach the limit. So uh, yeah, we need to really understand when we formulate the low crude protein diets of course will be good because we don't have too much substrate for the bacteria but if we don't control all the amino acids then the animals will not grow so it's good to reduce the crude protein of the diet but we need to yeah really understand the digestibility of the ingredients and what is the right amount of nutrients because if we yeah go too much uh, to low crude protein diets and the amino acid profile is not con yeah under control then the animals will, will not grow. So then what we need uh, more and more, we say is to understand, okay, when we change the, the nutrients here and we have less substrate for the uh, bacteria, yeah, is this helping to, to, to have a better heart health and, and grow and what nutrients and, and, and what substrate do does the E. coli, but also the Suez or Clostridium goes once because without antibiotics, everything that is not digested here will go for the bacteria and everything that goes further will be fermented. So the interaction substrate and bacteria is more and more important for the, yeah, for the future. So then we say, uh, uh, back to the, the, the discussion here, uh, we say uh, a stomach needs to work. And, uh, and also we have been working quite a bit on the concept of buffering capacity, acidification of the diet. But we have also seen in, the, uh, yeah, in some recent work that not only, for example, organic acids can play a role on, uh, on having a good stomach, also particle size of the diet can play a role. So on the, on the coming slides, I would like more to, uh, yeah, to show you some interesting work on why maybe we need some structure into piglets diets in order to improve the gut health. So this is a trial that we did also in the Schotters, was one diet, same diet composition, and the only difference was to that we have uh, in pellet or in mash form, and, 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 and we were giving to the animals, let's say, but the, the diet composition was totally the, the, the same. So we look to the first week past winning, we didn't see much differences, only we see uh, in fecal score. So FS means fecal score. We saw that with the mice diet, the fecal score was better compared to pellet. And, uh, and when we saw this, we said, oh, maybe it's interesting to further go into that direction because when we have mice diet, we have more particles. And maybe if we have more particles would mean longer retention time in the stomach and more 
uh, let's say, gradual transition of nutrients to the gut. And that means that, yeah, less diarrhea. So although we say, okay, if you, if you go from pellet to mash, your digestibility should go down. In piglets, it seems that particles are really important. And you see in the second phase, in, in, in week two, you see again that with this mice diet, the feed intake uh, goes up, the growth goes up, but you see FCI is, a, yeah, is a slightly higher. So of course we, we lose some efficiencies, let's say. And, and if you look for the overall period, you see again that with the mice diets, you will have a better fecal score, but we have a slightly higher FCI. So that means that, of course, we want everything. No, as nutritionists, we want good FCI, good efficiency, and we want good health. So probably we need to understand, okay, when we make pellet diets, can we still incorporate some particles in order to have these yeah, positive effects on gut health and on fecal score? So this is some work uh, that also have been done in piglets. This is done in Denmark, where they look to the effect of, uh, uh, of diet fine versus coarse, and also pellet versus non-pellet. So here you see four different treatments. F means fine, C means coarse. So here you have fine, coarse, fine, coarse. And then NP means non-pellet, non-pellet, pellet, pellet. So then if you look here, what is the, the what means the form? Means pellet versus uh, uh, non-pellet. Grinding me means, uh, let's say, coarse versus fine. So they gave these diets for four weeks to the piglets and then they euthanized the animals and they looked to the stomach, the small intestine, cecum and colon. And what you see in the stomach, we see an effect of the form. So then you see, uh, uh, let's say that in the pellet, you see a smaller stomachs compared to the non-pellet. So non-pellet means bigger stomachs. And also you clearly see if you compare the fine versus coarse, you see fine versus coarse, you see coarse, also bigger stomachs compared to fine. So here again, if we have big particles, more particles in the stomach uh, uh, will remain, bigger stomachs uh, will be there. If we look to the, the small intestine, we found an effect of grinding. And then you see that the fine, you see these two fines, longer uh, small intestine compared to coarse. So it seems that when the, when the diets are really fine grinded, more nutrients will go to the gut. So the, the gut will adapt to increase the surface to have a better absorption because if not, the nutrients will pass uh, away. And the only interaction that we found was on the cecum and, and colon. And here what we found is that the the highest, the, the biggest cecum and colon was with the particles coarse and non-pellet. Whereas if we had coarse and pellet, you see no difference. So uh, still, if we want to keep a structure, probably it's easy uh, to have it in non-pellet diets compared to pellet diets. But this is our, uh, our challenge is to have this. Uh, so our goal is still to use pellets, but we want to have enough structure in these pellets. And this is uh, why we want this. So this is a work in New Zealand that was done in, in swine. So this is what you see in blue is the, the starch of the rice that is, it, it has been, let's say, with the dye has been uh, uh, marked, let's say. And here what you see is the stomach of a pig when they receive brown rice or rice with fiber or only with, uh, white rice without fiber. And this is two hours after eating. So you see that the fiber portion is here in the uh, down part and the starch remains more on the upper part of the stomach. If we look eight hours after digestion, you see that only with rice, no structure, only a starch in the diet, the stomachs are almost empty. Whereas if you still have some uh, uh, fiber coming from the brown rice, the stomach content is higher. So there's a more gradual transition of nutrients from the gut, uh, from the stomach to the gut. And this we think that is positive for, for the piglets. And also when we have a longer retention on the stomach, what they also observe in this work is that it, they look also to the pH in this proximal and in distal part. So if you look to the pH in blue, white rice and in, in more dark, the brown rice, proximal region, no difference in pH. Whereas if we go to this region before it goes to the small intestine, then you see that after 20 minutes of, eat, of eating, the animals receiving the brown rice, the pH goes down. So a bigger part of more 
more fiber, coarse particles, means longer retention time, means lower pH in the stomach, and it means probably better protection uh, for the animals. So if we go back to the, let's say, to the, 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 the total concept, we say before, uh, in the first initial phase, focus on developing the, the microbiota and the innate immune system, especially the focus should start already in the colostrum and also probably working with the diets of the lactating cells before farrowing. Before weaning, we need to start working with the diet and we don't need to change the diet. We need to keep the diet before and after weaning and this diet should focus on preparing the gut. So probably here we need to uh, uh, concentrate not too much the nutrients because if not, the animals will not be the, able to digest and will have uh, health problems. And then, yeah, if you look to the yeah, total program, let's say we say the first, uh, let's say before and after weaning, uh, reduce the pH, focus on also on reducing the buffering capacity uh, sorry, low the crude protein, focus on the uh, buffering capacity, use more functional amino acids. We have seen the positive effect on the inner fiber, limit the fermentable fiber because the animals are not prepared and also try to start working with particles. So we need some structure in the diet so the stomachs are bigger and also the pH goes down. When the animals have faced this uh, yeah, a stress situation, then we can uh, yeah, start increasing the lysine to net energy ratio because with lysine intake, the animals will uh, start to grow. We can go down a bit on the inner fiber and uh, start incorporating the fermentable fiber. And uh, at the end of the, let's say, when the animals are around three weeks post winning or something like this, we can uh, start working on a more simple diet and we can push more for the lysine to net energy and we can also start giving more fermentable fiber than inert fiber because also from this fermentable fiber, the animals will get energy. So try to prepare the animals here and also before winning to have a successful pause winning, but also growing finishing uh, uh, period. And that was it from, uh, from my side. Th thank you so far for all your attention. It's a pity that I cannot see you and we cannot interact, but uh, if you have questions, uh, yeah, please let me know. Still, I think we have some time to answer your questions. Thanks for your attention. Great, Francesc, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, we do have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, appreciate that. And we know that you have a, a very uh, tight schedule today. You're quite busy today. We appreciate that you're here with us. We're gonna stick around for a couple more questions. Yeah, There's no one problem. question that Federico wants to answer live. So also you can take some breath, Francesc. You can drink some water. Federico already mentioned that once that he wants to answer live. Federico, yeah. please go ahead with the first one. You are on mute, Federico. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I was uh, saying that Frances has mentioned during the presentation, that uh, there is a, a win an immunitary window uh, and somebody's asking about how to cover this immunitary window if there is uh, some kind of feed additives that can increase the immunity in calostrum or what we can do uh, I, as far as i know uh, there are some experiences uh, that with with feed additives that has uh, demonstrated an increase in a concentration of immunity uh, in calostrum, but all of them are related with animals that are uh, facing some challenge with mycotoxins in, in the feed, in the uh, sow's feed. This means that uh, a way to ensure the maximum uh, quality or, uh, or quantity or of uh, immunoglobulins in the calostrum, we need to be sure that we are blocking the, the uh, immunodepression uh, that is caused by uh, mycotoxins. But it's not easy to increase the concentration of uh, uh, immunoglobulins in calostrum. What we can do is to help the, uh, the, the piglets as soon as uh, they are uh, received that they received the calostrum from the mother and help them with external uh, feed additives, as we have mentioned in other uh, part of this course, 
uh, with with um, an external uh, amount of uh, of um, monoglobulins and energy too. But it is it's not easy to change the capability of the cells to produce calostrum. Right. Uh, Francesc, we do have one question about the uh, in inert carbohydrate from Carmen Sodevilla. Yeah. In the trial about inert carbohydrate, which percentage of inert carbohydrate were high and low? Which level of this carbohydrate do you think is the best in a transition diet to have the best microbiota for the pigments? Yeah, I think this is uh, the question regarding the sows in lactation, I think. So then uh, in sows in lactation, of course, we look to the total dietary approach, let's say. So then, yeah, of, when we look to the inner fiber, we say uh, somewhere close to, uh, yeah, between 10 and 12% of inner fiber uh, should help, let's say, to, to change the, the, yeah, to have enough, let's say, uh, supply. Because if we go too high, then of course we have seen in sows that if we go too high in inner fiber, then we restrict too much the feed intake and this can also be a problem. So there's an optimum on the, on the amount of fiber. So between 10 and 12% of inner fiber should be okay. And then regarding the sources, yeah, I think you, you point out a bit the, the mycotoxin problem, right? So if you, if you are able to control the mycotoxin contamination, then I think uh, oat hulls, uh, sunflower hulls, uh, this kind of products uh, are okay. Wheat bran can be okay still, but sows can ferment a bit still uh, with bran, so it would be less inert. Uh, and now we are doing uh, some work, for example, with alfalfa, because alfalfa uh, yeah, is, is an ingredient that has not been used uh, much in, uh, in, uh, in sow diets. And we think that probably can also have some uh, properties, but alfalfa will be 50-50 inert and, and fermentable, let's say. So, so then I think it's a combination of ingredients that you should arrive there, because if you only use one, and, uh, and this ingredient has plenty of mycotoxins, then you'll have a lot of problems, I would say. Uh, great. Uh, Federico? Yeah, we, we have uh, some other questions for Francesc. Uh, we have uh, two questions that are really uh, related because they are uh, asking about the use of thinoxide uh, in this trial that you have. Uh, share with us and um, which are the levels that you consider as low or high zinc oxide uh, in, in these diets? I assume the, let's say the trial that we, I refer to was the uh, trial that we still use two kilos of zinc oxide uh, in the diet. So you say two, two and a half kilos. This is what we, what I call high. And, uh, and what I mean low is now 150 ppm. So now we can only use zinc oxide as, uh, let's say, as nutrient and not from antimicrobial approach. So that's uh, the current situation already in the Netherlands since three years that we cannot use zinc oxide at high levels. So we can just use nutrient, uh, zinc oxide as nutrient, let's say. But that brings us to a very interesting question. I'm glad uh, we have the same question. Because these 150 ppm plus, these are considered nutritional levels, right? Yeah. But if you see that there's a huge gap between zinc oxide, zinc levels in plasma from the nutritional and the 2000, means that somehow we have to reevaluate levels, right? So maybe yeah, we're that, having a gap somewhere. Yeah, that that that's the the difficult part. If we'll do a digestibility trial with zinc oxide. We see that uh, yeah, 80% of the zinc oxide is not absorbed, so the digestibility yeah. is very poor, but we still see positive effects. So, so, so that's why it's, uh, yeah, it's really interesting because we have done this trial with zinc sulfate or other zinc sources, and we see a drop on the, on the plasma level. So uh, yeah, still, uh, I think we could do another thesis or another PhD on understanding the mode of action of zinc oxide <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it's not really clear for me why only zinc oxide, we see that plasma zinc remains uh, high, whereas other sources of zinc at a similar level not. So, it's, yeah, it's really yeah. interesting, yeah. but is a fact. And, uh, and this is so far the, 
yeah, an effect that we have seen and, and we have triggered us because we are not able to bring the level back. So that's why we say, yeah, if you have some suggestion to bring the level back or you have tried, please let us know. I think we can we can run several PhD thesis on that, right? Yes, for sure. Um, we do have a question from Eric Brunix. I hope yes. Eric, I said I, I hope I have uh, the right Eric Brownix, Brunix. Yes. Brownix. So, what is the logic about the simulation of amylase activity in the gut when you provide inert fiber? How does yes. that work? Yeah. So the. Uh, uh, when we this this measurement was to to find a marker to say okay is the gut development better or not because in the past we we have also and you have seen also some results on the bilus height and creep depth discussion no? but it was not always clear that higher bilus height or, or lower creep depth result in better performance so we said okay maybe we need to look to the brush board enzymes to understand if, if we can find the good market to see if the, the, the gut is more uh, developed or not. And when we did this trial, we were surprised that when you work with the fiber and then you could, we know that the inner fiber will have a more physical effect on the gut. So then uh, we have also seen changes on the mucine production. So, so we kind of speculate, let's say that the, the the or the speculation behind will be that with inert fiber the gut is more trigger let's say and it could recover faster the, the enzyme activity that when you have a really high digestible low fiber approach and you win the animals uh, need to recover more so so that's yeah that, that's the if you say it's a, a direct relation or it's an indirect relation probably it's not direct relation but we we have seen this uh, in other trials and uh, what is constant with the inner fiber is that fecal score is better a stomach uh, uh, depending on the particle size can be higher and uh, yeah and the animals uh, if they remain healthy they will be longer also uh, healthy so that's the so we use more this as a marker to show that the, in our perception when you use fiber you help to develop the gut and not focus too much on the bilus height and creep depth because there's not always a relation with gut health or performance so let's say it's a general gut health uh, uh, evaluation right so it yeah. means that the, the enterocytes are more ready and therefore also the enzymatic system is more able to to, yeah, this is the, to, my easy interpretation, but if you have others, yeah. I'm also open to hear other opinions, no problem. I'm pretty sure that uh, we'll hear that, Frances. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know that we are a little bit over time. Uh, maybe we have question, Maybe we have time for two more questions. Yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah? Five more minutes, I can stay still, Felipe, no problem. Okay, <laughs> then, Great. then we are going with a, a question from Antonio Palomo from Spain. And... Uh, He's asking about your opinion about the influence of electrolyte balance in South transition diet uh, to the pre-winning gastrointestinal piglet development and the microbiota modulation action. Yes, so the, if I look to the, the electrolyte balance, we work with the electrolyte balance and we work with the concept that we want to create a difference between gestation and lactation. And the concept behind is that uh, we think uh, similar what would happen in dairy, that if you change also the electrolyte balance, the, you can influence also the, the let's say, the, the farrowing uh, because the, the, the sow needs to mobilize more calcium and is also good for the contraction. What I'm not aware is work relating the electrolyte balance and microbiota. So I have not seen work where you manipulate the electrolyte balance and you can say, okay, uh, with this electrolyte balance, uh, yeah, you can also positively or negatively or, or non-influence the microbiota. This, this we, we are not aware. What we have seen in other trials is that, uh, yeah, depending not only in the electrolyte balance, but also, for example, on the phosphor content of the, uh, of the diet, we can have an input on the duration of the farrowing time. And then we, yeah, there's more and more work conduct that the shorter the farrowing time, the better for the sow, but also for the piglets. And, and that's why we say, okay, in this uh, farrowing uh, concept, probably we need also to work not only on the fiber, but also minerals and the uh, electrolyte balance to have a, yeah, a shorter farrowing time as much as we can. So uh, yeah, 
uh, piglets do not face hypoxia and these kind of things. But I'm not, I have not seen work relating microbiota and electrolyte balance in South. This I'm not aware of. Right, Francesc, one very practical question. Programming the immune system. How do yeah. you suggest that practical nutritionists do this? Yeah, so if you say, uh, if we start with the sows, I would say, yeah, try to manipulate already the colostrum. And I agree with Frederico that it's not easy to change the immunoglobulin content. But I think there are some uh, concepts there that can play a role on changing the immunoglobulin content of the colostrum. And then you will get the, the, the maternal antibodies to the, to the piglets. Yeah, another option that uh, is not via the diet, but is vaccinating the sow, right? So now with the streptococcus suis problem, uh, one of the solution is using auto vaccines to to yeah to try to bring the protection to the to the piglets, and and that's why I said okay, probably in the future we need to do more work nutrition and vaccination, and then some work that we did uh, also uh, uh, and we have seen positive effects is that if we expose the piglets to antigens in the pre-winning phase. And one example would be, for example, uh, anti-nutritional factors from the soya, lectins, or these that, uh, that are like uh, Im immunogenic for, or immunogenic for the piglets. If we expose them pre-winning, it seems that also the immune system can also be more prepared. And, and, and also, I think there's some additive targets targeting the immune development. So the idea is that we expose the animals to an antigen, the immune system react, uh, becomes more robust, but then what we want is this oral tolerance because if the immune system is reacting all the time, yeah, then the animals will spend energy and will not grow. So we want to, yeah, that the animals react, they, they, the immune system uh, becomes more robust, but then we get this oral tolerance and there's no more reaction if not needed, let's say. That would be the idea. All right. Um, we do have questions coming still, so there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions here yeah. on the on the chat. Francesc, we'll do the following. Uh, all the questions that are unanswered here, or if the audience has uh, further questions, please yeah. send it to the email here that you can see on the screen. Yes. And Federico and I will take care of sending these questions and uh, to Francesc. And as soon as we have an answer also from Francesc, we're gonna come back to to all of you. Okay. So I'm sorry we are not able to answer all of that, but let's let's keep the conversation here via email, and then we're gonna send all the questions back to. Francesc, okay? Sounds good, yes. Great, so uh, Francesc, once again, thanks a lot for your presentation today. Thanks a lot for your time. Um, I want to remember all of you that the recording of this presentation is also available. So please contact your, your, uh, your team in your country. Uh, so your main contact in your country. And if you want, you can request also the video of this presentation. Uh, my pleasure to say that our first course in uh, piglet management and farm profitability has come to an end. Um, I'm very, very proud and very happy on what happened here. Uh, we have four great sessions, a very, very good audience, a lot of interaction, a lot of knowledge transfer. So I'm very excited. And on behalf of the whole EDA nutrition, my colleague Federico, my colleagues from marketing, on behalf of all of us, I would say thanks a lot for being here with us. Thanks a lot for joining the sessions. And we do expect that also we helped you to leverage your knowledge on pig nutrition and pig management. And also we expect you to leverage, of course, the profitability of your farm. For now, that's it. So I would say on my behalf and on behalf of Ida Nutrition to say thanks. I hope we're gonna see each other again. Francesc, once again, appreciate for this great session and for helping us to close this course in a very high style. So thanks a lot for your talk today, Francesc. No, thanks again for the invitation, Felipe. Always a pleasure to work with you. Have a great day. Thanks. Federico, thanks a lot for helping us here. It has been a pleasure to be collaborating during the, the course. Thanks for everybody to, to join our first and I suppose that it's not going to be the last one. <laughs>
of course, Lars. We'll we'll meet again soon, all of you. Thanks also to also to thanks also to our interpreters, Sherry and Lourdes. Thanks a lot for supporting us on Spanish Spanish and Chinese translation. Appreciate your time, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.